Next, the sweet voice of an operatic legend. Then, a washboard with an instrumental sound. And later, music therapy for senior citizens. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Today we're at the Guitar House Workshop off Chambers Road, and it's a beautiful place to make music. Music can express so many emotions, love, joy, sorrow, even struggle. That's right, and music can also explore issues of identity and belonging, and that's where our focus is today. Like so many of our immigrants, both past and present, we want to explore what it's like to belong to more than one community or more than one culture. Our first story is about Ruby Elzey, an African-American singer with roots in rural Mississippi and Columbus, Ohio. Ruby Elsie was one of the pioneer African-American opera singers of the early part of the 20th century. Where is this road leading me to? Ruby Elsie's story is almost um, like a fairy tale. Here is a young black girl who is born in the heart of Jim Crow, Mississippi in the first decade of the 20th century. Father abandons the family when she's only five years old, um, but in large part through the determination of her very devout and hardworking mother, um, she achieved opportunities to get an education. And her big break came in 1927, when as a freshman at Russ College, one of the historic black colleges and universities uh, in the town of Holly Springs, Mississippi, she was overheard singing by a visiting professor from The Ohio State University, Dr. C.C. McCracken. And the president said, well, that's Ruby Elsie. This girl really wants to be a singer, but we don't have the means to train her. And Dr. McCracken decided, you know, I'm gonna see if I can bring her to Columbus, to Ohio State, because Ohio State had just started its Department of Music. Dr. McCracken went back to Russ the next day and I said, Ruby, if I can make it possible for you to come to Columbus, would you like to study at Ohio State? And she said, yes, I would, if it's okay with my mother. So he had to persuade her mother, because you're thinking about here is the 1927, and uh, Emma Elsie, Ruby's mother, is being asked to entrust her daughter into the care of a white man she has never met who lives 700 miles away. Um, so it was an act of great faith on everyone's part. Ruby came to Columbus in June of 1927, entered Ohio State that fall, um, studied under Dr. Hughes, who was the founder of the department, graduated with honors in 1930. Dr. McCracken and Dr. Hughes got her then a scholarship to the Juilliard School in New York City. She arrived in New York in, in October of 1930 entered Juilliard and the next week made her debut on Broadway in the chorus of Brown Buddies with Bill Bojangles Robinson. And then in 1935, George Gershwin is um, casting for a first ever American folk opera, as he calls it, Porgy and Bess. And Ruby Elsie is one of the singers that he auditions and he casts her after only hearing her sing one song, casts her in the role of Serena 
in Porgy and Bess. She makes her debut in October 1935. Ruby Elsie and her co-stars in that show, Todd Duncan and Brown, who played the title roles, all three become very celebrated, and Ruby goes on to a wonderful career in radio, in concerts, in films, and uh, even sings um, at the Apollo Theater uh, in Harlem as a headliner. And the great uh, success of her life is singing at the White House at the invitation of Eleanor Roosevelt in December 1937. Her dream, though, is to sing in grand opera. In 1942, she sets her sights on a career in grand opera and is actually given a contract to sing the title role of Aida. But unfortunately, um, she develops a benign tumor, um, undergoes surgery in a Detroit hospital, and for whatever reason, um, dies in surgery. She's only 35 years of age, so it's 1943, and, and as happened so often with so many of the gifted black artists of that time, she kind of like falls through the cracks and for decades um, is just just forgotten and uh, so it was a great joy to me that uh, while I was at WOSU in the late 1990s and got to meet Madge Guthrie who was who was on our board and um, and she and I were talking one day over lunch and she said well David have you ever heard of a singer named Ruby Elsie and I said no I haven't she said well she was a classmate of mine in Ohio State Madge had been in the girls glee with Ruby Elsie in 1929 and uh, so she kind of started me on the whole adventure and it took five years to actually research her story and write it. On the journey now, I'm on the journey now. I'm trying to win the one take nothing. I'm trying for my journey now. Her first radio appearance ever was on WEAO, which of course for anybody that knows the history of WOSU knows that that was the original call letters for WOSU. It's a story that Columbus, Ohio State, and WOSU can all take pride because had she not been able to come here, um, she might have just simply um, been like, as so many other people um, of her race and her generation, you know, just limited to opportunities in Mississippi. But as it was, she went on and had a really stunning career um, that deserves to be remembered and celebrated. Next, a visit to the Columbus Washboard Company. And then, a local ensemble brings joy to senior citizens. When you think of an instrument, Javier, what comes mm -hmm. to mind? Well, I love pianos, but I mean, being here, you've got guitars and banjos and ukuleles, so it's, I love it. I know, it's great, but what about a washboard? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? The Columbus Washboard Company has a whole line of washboards just for that use. Jeff Darby visits their factory in Logan to find out more. Today we're in the Hocking Hills in Logan, the seat of Hocking County, and we're going to visit an interesting place called the Columbus Washboard Company. As you might guess, it used to be in Columbus, it's now in Logan. I want to find out how they make washboards and who today is buying these things. Washboards are a little out of date, but I guess there's a market for them, and we're going to find out why. Jackie, hello. Well, good morning. How, How are, are you? you? Good to meet you, Jeff Nice Darby. to meet you, too. Well, I've been for looking forward to coming here. Well, I've welcome about, to the Columbus uh, Washboard well, Company. Thank you. I've heard about Columbus Washboard, and I'm always curious about history. Uh, when did it begin? 1895 in Columbus, Ohio. In Columbus, um, It's actually name. owned by the Martin family. In um, 1999, they were going to close it down. They didn't have the sales like we have today, and they had advertised that it was for sale. So a group of us got together and purchased it and moved it here to this old shoe factory in Logan, Ohio. So it was a Logan group that, that bought it, the company. It was. Kept the name because of the continuity exactly, through the years. Exactly, exactly. So I'd love to see how these washboards are made. Okay, well let's go do a tour of the factory. Follow okay. me. Am 
my, I see washboards everywhere. Oh, I know, and this is the main factory room. Okay. But we're actually going to start out in the wood room so that you can see how things are made. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, let's go. It's the uh, manufacturing process that's so fascinating. Well, we still use a lot of the old machinery, which is really neat. Oh, I, yeah, I, I can see. This little machine here was still used when we purchased the company. What it does is the finger joints on either side, on either end of the mm -hmm, head okay. of the washboard. Mm -hmm. This is Ohio poplar, so we're very proud to be using Ohio wood. So is poplar really all you use? It's a little harder than the pine we used to use, uh -huh. but it's actually um, more sturdy and, and it's more stable as a washboard. It's more durable when it gets wet. So this is a one at a time machine. Mm -hmm. This machine here will do 24 at a time. And we still use that one sometimes if we're doing one or two, but for a large amount, for our big orders, we just use this uh, machine. Now this okay. machine, this is one of the old original machines too. And obviously if you've got uh, finger joints in the head, you have to have finger joints in the leg. Mm -hmm. So this one does the finger joints in here. So there's a, there's a cutting blade in there yes. that cuts the slots. You can see the blades yeah. Yeah, and okay. you just push it in there. Once again, because we only have a small staff, we use this machine here and we can do 20 at a time in here. Okay. Yeah. Now this machine here, this is another important part of the process. Oh, let's see. We have to do rail holes, obviously. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yep. So this machine here is the original, but my husband took the low-speed drills out and put high-speed routers in here. And the action for this is that way, pull it to the side, that way, and then slide it across, and it might makes a nice oh, oval-shaped okay. hole. Oh, Okay, so it pushes, it pushes the piece against the yeah. tool. Yeah. Okay, it makes an oval-shaped slot. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. And this machine down here also does the same thing, only on the smaller size. All right, let's have a look at it. Okay, so for the smaller pieces. Yeah, this is for the pale size washboards. So how many different sizes do you make? We do small? three. Okay. The family size, the pale size, and then we have a small mini size that we sell for children, little girls to do dollies washing <laughs> or just as an, uh, a decorative item. So these girls are learning in the old ways before mm -hmm. they get onto mom's washing machine. Yes, okay. they do. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll go into the factory and see how they're assembled. Can you guess how long it takes to put together a washboard? No, I can't, but I was going to say, I'm sure you can show the boys how to do this, too. I think we will. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's go. Anyway, in the meantime, okay. you can think about how long it's going to take. Yes. <laughs> the first machine I'd like to talk to you about is the old nailing machine, which is right here. You say old, so they're not in use anymore. No, no longer. Um, they were actually still in use when we bought the company, but they're really inefficient. But what it would do is nail in six places at one time, as you can see by this washboard we oh, have sure. in here. The top has, has a box full of nails, the whole machine vibrates, then these nails come down these tubes here. Well, obviously you can see by the turn in the tube that we would have a problem with it catching. That's where the inefficiency came yeah. in? Yeah. Okay. So, it's better to be more efficient, so we sure. changed to modern nail guns. They had guns. a tendency to jam and not nail properly. Frequently. You lost time. Frequently. Yeah, yeah. Frequently. So Let's imperfect go on down. machinery. Imperfect machinery. No, <laughs> okay. it was perfect at the time, but... Yeah, but now it's better. <laughs> okay. Look at all these parts. These neat presses that we have here are still in use. These are the original ones from the factory. Um, the only thing we had to do was replace some of the woodware on there. And we'll step next door and watch Lisa put one together for All us. All right. Hi, Lisa. Hello. How are you? I'm Jeff. Oh, fine, thank you. Good how to see you? you. Can you guess how long it takes to make a washboard? I'm going to guess less time than I would think. That doesn't give me an answer. Uh, 30 seconds. Oh, that's pretty good. Most people say a minute. It's actually 45 seconds. Oh. So you did pretty good. Not bad. Okay, Lisa. She's going to put the head and the leg together, put it in the press. Then she's going to grab the nameplate and top rail. And she's going to put the metal in, which we crimp here ourselves. Bottom rail. Then she's going to do the outside leg. She's going to give it a little tap to make sure everything's together. Uh -huh. And then she's going to nail it. At least I, I can tell you've done this before. <laughs> for how many years now? 13, 13 years. years. Good for you. Anyway, thanks, Lisa. There's a certain pun in the, in the name, of course. Uh, made right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll move down here. 
Oh, I noticed these before. These are printing. printing these drums? are the original dies for the printing press. Okay. And if you want to just have a hold of that. Oh yeah, boy, that is heavy. It's lead and brass. I was going to say, yeah, it feels like there's and lead in there. And this is another machine that's really amazing, and it used to do all of the printing, but it got to the point where a lot of the dies were worn and really uneven looking. Oh yeah, I can see what you mean. So we now do mm -hmm. a modern um, printing. The girls actually do it here at the factory. This is an example of some of the stuff that the girls do. Um, proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. That was designed for the soldiers. Sure. And well, that makes sense. Uh, American troops stationed These abroad, are, they, they would need something like this. They did, and we, they've used a lot of them. We've sent over 5,000 kits. Have you really? This is a selection of some of the ones that we, we print here. Rhythm board, that does not sound like washing. Music. <laughs> Music. <laughs> so that's part of your market would be jug bands, right? It is. Definitely. Good. It definitely is. Now, some people still use them for laundry. Mm -hmm. We do sell a lot of glass washboards in Bahamas and Hawaii because, obviously, if it's glass, it's not going to rust. And, right. and they have the sea air. Right. So we do sell a lot to them. Let's go down and look where we crimp the metal now. Okay. Oh, yeah, here's a big reel of um, mm -hmm. coil. Steel. Yeah, we usually buy a thousand pound roll, mm -hmm. exactly the width that we need it, and then it's fed through two rollers which are hidden under here. This is uh, what it looks like when it comes through the rollers. It has, um, oh yeah, yeah, it has a crimp. I'll show you this crimp here. This is called a double handy crimp, you can use both sides. This side is um, coarser, you feel that. This oh, is yeah. coarse. This is for doing like grass stains on your socks or the jeans. So and that's what actually knocks the dirt the, loose. Right. And on the other side, if you fill that, that is a smoother. And that's mm -hmm. where you do your lingerie. Okay. The smoother. I don't do my lingerie. No, but. well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and we sell um, two different kinds of metal now. We have galvanized metal, obviously, mm -hmm. and stainless steel, which the musicians like. Because the galvanized metal... If they're a serious musician, they'll wear through it in six months. Oh, sure. The but galvanizing if, is just yeah. a coating. That's right. But if they use the stainless steel, it's okay. more durable for their... Right. And it doesn't yeah. rust. Well, this has been a great tour. I really appreciate it. And I've, I've learned things I didn't know, that's for sure. Well, thank you for coming. We really enjoy showing it off. We're proud to be the last washboard company in the United States. I had a feeling Still in that business. Was, I had a feeling that was the case. Uh, not too many companies like this. No, there isn't. And we are a big tourist trap for this area. We do have a we're a rainy day special place to I visit. I think that's great. Well, thank you so much for a great tour. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. You may know Ben Gelber as a longtime weatherman, but he's also the head of a local ensemble that brings Jewish and Yiddish music to senior centers. And it's more than music, though, that echoes through the halls. It's the rich cultural heritage that binds generations together. Well, my parents were uh, very big into classical music, especially my father used to play uh, uh, classical music uh, around uh, our bedtimes. I heard some at maybe a, a Friday night service, but I didn't pay that close attention to it until I had to uh, learn it for bar mitzvah. You know, in your bar mitzvah, you essentially at age 13 become a junior rabbi, uh, for one time anyway, because you conduct the service, which means I had to sing. The Friday night service melodies, which I consider the traditional melodic minor, uh, always caught my ear because I thought they had an intrinsic uh, beauty um, and a very uh, almost angelic quality, as well as uh, the, the traditional spiritual. And so I wasn't so much listening to the, uh, uh, the words as much as I was in my head imagining the melodies and the chords. And I took some of that to the piano when I would dabble around between piano lessons. Uh, but there it sat for probably a couple of decades uh, until I began to conceive of creating uh, an ensemble that would lift these melodies beyond uh, just maybe what I would hear in a religious service uh, or even a, a Jewish wedding uh, and, and construct uh, all these different parts and layers, uh, add vocals and essentially bring out uh, what I consider some of the hidden beauty uh, in the melodies. It would have been around uh, 2010 
where I became uh, interested in actually doing something with an idea which uh, I had conceived of, which entailed taking some of these melodies and uh, bringing them into the mainstream. And then the second time, and then, and then we come in with vocals. I found out my mom was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And at the same time, my father uh, was in the very early stages of uh, Alzheimer's. I knew a little bit about the, the concept of music therapy and Alzheimer's uh, disease in researching with regard to my father. However, I didn't really experience this until we performed at Wexner Heritage Village. And I heard back from uh, the folks there after the concert that many of the residents were still singing and humming the melodies after we left. And that was the first inkling I had that this really is something important. All day long I'd biddy biddy bum if I were a wealthy man. We're playing at National Church Residences at Mill Run, and this is where my dad stayed uh, before he passed away earlier this year, and I brought my uncle, who's 95, from New York to be with my dad during those final months, and he's here in the audience, too. Very nice concert. I was singing along. <laughs> my parents liked music, and everybody in my family uh, played an instrument but me. And so I was always surrounded by some kind of music. Music um, really truly enriches our lives. It ties our, our memories um, into our long-term memory. We remember, you know, our, our first dance at our wedding, the songs we used to sing to our kids. Um, so all of that um, sensory connection just helps commit those memories to our long term. It's not about the performance, it's about bringing joy to folks and taking the music and making it portable. It's difficult, if not impossible, uh, as I would learn from my father's uh, extended care, you know, to go ever again to maybe a, a service or a wedding. So we can bring the music to uh, seniors, to memory care uh, residents. We played for about 50 Holocaust survivors and their families. That particular concert was especially emotional and there were a lot of tears, on, I think, on both sides. We actually have about 237 Holocaust survivors in Columbus. And they come from all over Europe and they speak many different languages um, from Russian, German, Hungarian, Romanian. So music really provides that unifying force. And then when you put in klezmer music, which is what Ben and his band Friday Night Live play, that is music from uh, this Yiddish and Hebrew music that they grew up with. So it brings back these pleasurable memories of a time before the war when they were with their families. I was born in Ukraine and it was time when nothing should be said about Jewish people. How they behave, tradition, all this stuff. It was forbidden. My grandfather had three passions in life, family, books, and music. And my dad inherited this from him. So that is my luck. Shalom Aleichem, Malachi It seems to me that it's changed person. Even if the person did not realize it, you know, because most, uh, music evoked my memories, only good stuff. It evoked the best in the, my life. Well, I think every time we perform the melodies, you know, you think of your parents because they knew as well as anyone the core of all these melodies far better than I did. They understood the cultural aspects of 
all these melodies. I specifically chose traditional versions of the melodies uh, that represents their generation to honor them. It's kind of a, uh, a thank you, I think, for all that we uh, experienced and what was handed down through my uh, grandparents and to my parents and things that can kind of drift away if you don't wrap your arms around them and kind of bring them back. I prefer and I think that everyone is more enjoyable is sitting as a whole surrounded by community and listen to live sound of music. I was so touched and influ influenced by uh, this music that, you know, in one moment it's brought me back in time. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you.